Hi, this is Little Dwarf and I welcome you to the third episode covering secrets, easter eggs and hidden details you might have missed in Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines. To see the previous episodes, please take a look at the links in the description. There are also additional information and links for broader context about my findings there. This episode will cover the content from the downtown hub as well as the Elizabeth Dane, Grout's Mansion and the Museum as you visit those areas while generally staying in downtown. First, let's take a look at the streets of downtown LA. There is something about the NPC behaviors I wanted to show you. Sadly, NPCs in Bloodlines are rather lifeless, they just wander the streets without aim or purpose. Well, most of the time anyway. They do have a couple of unique behaviors or routines, but they happen at random so you might have not noticed them unless you happened upon them by chance. First, there are those peculiar rendezvous in the dark alleys near the confession club. Whenever I happen upon it, the animation seemed somehow broken or not playing completely right in the vanilla game, but it's clear enough from the guy zipping his pants that it's probably, well, an ending to a sexual encounter of sorts. Next, you can see some people making graffiti on the walls. Sometimes, you can even happen upon the murder scene in progress. Funnily enough, in my case, the guy with the covered head is always the perp and the guy in the red jacket is always the victim. Maybe there are other combinations though. I also could have sworn that I remembered NPCs trying to rob a car, but I waited and waited and it never happened in my vanilla game. Maybe it's an unofficial patch addition. Next, something you probably figured out if you've seen the previous episode, but I guess it's worth showing nonetheless. Who do you really talk to when the Malkavian decided to talk to the stop sign? It turns out that, as with the Kimball's intercom, it's an actual NPC. In this case, there is one here in the parking lot. He disappears right after you talk to him, since you can only talk to the stop sign once. Curiously, his model is that of a vampire hunter, but I guess it's inconsequential. Now, let's go inside the abandoned hospital where Pisha resides. Here, you can have some fun with the monitors. As with the newscaster, the events here are quote-unquote filmed in real time, so if you spawn or drop some items in the camera view in advance, they will show on the monitors. But what really surprised me is that the cameras give a live transmission to the monitors, and that means that if you move the physical cameras, the views on the monitors will change accordingly. With some creativity and perseverance, you can create funny scenarios. I decided to shatter the masquerade by transmitting Pisha's private life 24-7. Next, there is the Tremere Chantry. First, let's take a look at its layout. Due to the magic that prevents you from turning some corners, you may be excused for thinking it's much larger, but sadly it really isn't. If you no-clip around, you can see that all of those, those turns you couldn't make just end up in a dead end, but it teleports you in front of the Strauss's chamber doors before you can realize that. Funnily enough, it also works from the other side if you no-clip yourself into one of those dead ends. Continuing the trend from the previous episode, the paintings here are again real paintings. You can see Lilith, for example, who plays an important part in the myth of Cain and thus in the creation of vampires. The big painting in the center is, of course, Cain committing the murder that started this whole vampire mess in the first place, if the kindred creation myth is to be believed. 
Funnily enough, it's actually a very common scene in Bloodlines, depicted in several different versions by different painters, and somehow I don't think it's a coincidence. While I'm here, let's listen to the radio for a while. In general, it's a great source of humor and it's pretty hilarious overall. There's a link in the description for the entirety of it and it's well, well worth a listen. But the audition heard downtown is particularly interesting from an easter egg slash hidden detail standpoint. Good evening, Deb. Yes, I think that's implied by the title of the show. <laughs> Do you ever worry, Deb, that the world is going to end? I haven't felt that way since Brad Pitt got married. I bet you say that to all the girls. There is a red star in the night sky. The blood of mortals and the blood of ages all will be consumed. They are coming. These are the final nights. Okay, well, good luck in the next election, Senator. Apologies to all you night owls out there, but this girl's got something she's got to take care of for the next few minutes. You can hear Andre de Zimishi himself, the Sabbat Bishop of LA, calling a late night talk show to rumble about Gehenna, as if he didn't have anything more important to do. As you could hear, he was talking about how they are coming and how the blood of mortals and the blood of ages will be consumed, which is a clear reference to the rise of the antediluvians. But what you might have not known is the red star in the night sky. The red star in question is a comet and one of the portents of the end of the world, not only for kindred, who know it as the Wormwood, but also for the werewolves, who call it even more peculiar name, and Helios, the anti-sun. Enough about the Chantry, though. Let's visit the last round this time. There is only one thing of note here a machine selling condoms in the bathroom. Ordinary enough, of course, but not the brand. Dirty condoms, bleh. Somehow I wouldn't want to use that, because knowing the shittiness level of the world of darkness, they might actually already be used or something. But that's not the only reason I'm here. Just nearby is a very cool easter egg. In the abandoned building you visit as a part of the chase for Muddy, you witness an aftermath of a murder, someone gets beheaded, and you can play with the dismembered head, literally in this case. If you throw the head in the basketball basket nearby, you get a round of applause from an unseen audience. In the Skyline Apartments, there are some more real paintings. As well as some cameras which you can utilize in the same way already shown in the Pisha segment. There is also a newspaper clipping with the headline local newspaper sensationalizes fact, which I just find funny, because while that's something media does, it seldom states it so bluntly and clearly. Now, the Venture Tower, where Lacroix himself resides. First, the cameras at Chunk's desk. You know the drill already. If you place some items in their view, you can see it on the monitors afterwards. Up in the penthouse there's another bunch of real paintings, among them four different paintings of Cain disabling his brother, if you will. There are also some very interesting paintings in the Confession Club. I couldn't find the sources for that, but I am pretty convinced 
they must be real pieces of medieval art because they just look too genuine to be made up just for the game. And it would totally make sense for the game to feature some historical art in this place since the confession is a repurposed church. If anyone knows the exact sources of these, please let me know in the comments below. One last thing before I leave the downtown hub proper. I will make a separate episode showcasing all of the unique NPC reactions to the Nosferatu protagonist, but I just wanted to include this one because there's a little more to it than you might think at first. Baba Yaga! If you play a Nosferatu, the Russian mobsters refer to you as Baba Yaga, regardless of gender. A Baba Yaga is in Slavic folklore a powerful evil witch. She's pretty synonymous with a general stereotype of witches, an old shriveled crone living in the forest on a chicken leg hut. But what's the real easter egg slash funny detail in this case is that the actual World of Darkness lore states that Baba Yaga is indeed real, and not only that, she's a powerful Nosferatu elder sleeping beneath Russia. So, in a way, the mobster here was more right than he would ever know. Now, let's go on to the Elizabeth Dane. Sadly, as atmospheric as the location is, there isn't much actual content here to showcase, apart from some of the logs on the computer. One of the passwords is Antonio Bay, which is another direct reference to John Carpenter's movie The Fog, where the ship with the same name lands in the aforementioned Antonio Bay. But I guess it's a decent moment to tell you about my personal theory, that the overall story of the Dane in-game, a ship arriving derelict in the bay with the crew missing and an open sarcophagus on board, is awfully similar to Bram Stoker's Dracula. There, Dra Dracula himself arrives in London in much the same way, on a ship in a coffin. The coffin is opened, the crew is slaughtered and the rest is, well, history. Interestingly, the cameras on deck here are an exception to the general rule within the game and just show a static image with no way to interact with it. It was a surprise for me after all of the instances of live feed I've encountered elsewhere in the game. Another location that you'd think would contain much more material, but sadly doesn't, is the crowd's mansion. The first vaguely interesting thing here are Grout's diplomas, one of them for alternative medicine, apparently, which seems to suit his wacky personality and let's call them unorthodox methods of practicing psychiatry. It also features some text, which was too blurry for me to read in its entirety, but while I originally thought it had little to do with medicine altogether, after googling the part of it I could read, it turned out to be a translation of the original Hippocratic Oath, so it totally fits. The other interesting thing in the mansion is the collection of items surrounding Kraut's wife. I don't have any concrete info on those, just my personal theories, but they seem worth a look at nonetheless. There's a pocket watch, possibly one belonging to Kraut's wife. There is also a photo of a man and a woman. Could that be them together? There is also a red rose, maybe a gift from Kraut to his beloved. Next, more disturbingly, a decomposed or dissected bird, perhaps a, perhaps a pet of Kraut's wife. Next, there is a plush bunny, which might be a toy of Kraut's wife or an item somehow important to her. But lastly, and most gruesomely, there's an actual human brain which I imagine is probably belonging to Kraut's wife herself, which let's say it puts his efforts to quote-unquote cure her in a new light. It seems to me that they are items important to their relationship, 
and maybe to his wife herself in particular. The last piece of interest transports us to the Museum of Natural History. There's this kind of humorous sticker with the camera and the words we see you touching all that stuff. Well, that's all for this episode. As always, thank you for watching and please let me know what do you think about my findings or if you have any particular feedback for the future. That's all for this one and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!